It is good to be with you this morning. It's good to see everybody who's able to be out with us. Thank you so much for being here, especially the visitors. We're so very glad that you are here, especially with the patents. We rejoice with you for the occasion that uh, that brings you here. Seems like it, or at least it feels to me like a long time since I have been able to stand before you and speak to you in this way. So I'm so excited to be able to be with you this morning. Uh, as Brother Gary mentioned at the Lord's table, we remember the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord every single Sunday when we gather together. And we, as Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 11, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. That last part, until He comes, indicates that He did not stay dead. How important is the resurrection of Jesus Christ for Christians? I think of what Paul said in the 15th chapter of Corinthians, the first letter. Remember, if he had not risen, then we of or we are of all people the most to be pitied. You know, the world changed forever. That Sunday when our Lord raised from the dead. I read, just for my own benefit, I read through the gospel accounts regularly just to remind myself to keep the things that Jesus said and did fresh in my mind. And each time that I do that and I get towards the end and I get to the section where our Lord is there in the garden and then he's arrested and he goes through just the, the mockery of, of a trial. The beatings and the whippings and the crucifixion itself. And then that period of time when he was in the grave. I often find myself thinking about the hours before the resurrection of Jesus. And I find myself thinking about various individuals who were around our Lord, some of them as close as it was possible to be to Him, others just kind of in His orbit. And I find myself wondering what was happening with them, what was going through their minds. And with some of them, the information that we're given in Scripture gives us a really good idea. I want to start with Peter. Now, along with all of the other apostles, Peter was certainly sad. But with Peter, it went to a whole other area as well. Peter was ashamed. I want you to open your Bibles with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. We're going to start... In verse 30, Matthew 26, beginning in verse 30, it says this, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. <coughs> Excuse me. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly, I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. In Peter's mind, this might be the one occasion in all the time where he's known Jesus, that he could say Jesus has so said something that is flatly untrue. It's not going to happen. Maybe Jesus thinks it's going to happen. But I know myself, right? I know myself. 
And there is no scenario on the face of this earth that would ever move me to deny even knowing him. Jesus, you've done incredible things. You have demonstrated knowledge and, and wisdom beyond human ability, but you're wrong here. I will not do this thing. There's no scenario in which I would. And just a few hours later, we turn to verse 69. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him. standard, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you two are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. I don't think it's that difficult to picture in the mind's eye, Peter, maybe even having fallen on the ground, finding a private location and those tears just pouring. I don't think it's that difficult to see that. I don't think it's that difficult to hear what it must have sounded like. Deep, racking sobs is what comes into my mind. Peter had to have known. There's no question that he did. Things were not going well. This mockery of a trial that they're having here, this isn't going to end with Jesus' release. This isn't going to end with everyone shaking hands and embracing and it's all going to be fine with everyone. It's not going to end that way. He knew that. He had to have known that. I think it's pretty clear that he did when he's denying even knowing. He doesn't want to face the same things that Jesus is facing. And as he's denying even knowing him. I wonder what Peter felt like on the inside. His fear was stronger than his faith here. His fear was stronger than his loyalty here. And I wonder with each denial if it felt like something was breaking in him. And then there was that final one. The rooster crowed. Jesus turned and looked at Peter. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Would he ever be able to look the other apostles in the eyes again? Peter was sad. But Peter was also ashamed. Deeply so. And then there's John, the apostle. John's fighting throughout this ordeal. He is fighting to stay brave. He is fighting to stay loyal. Turn with me, if you will, to John 18. John chapter 18. He's been there. He's heard all of these, uh, these predictions and prophecies that Jesus has given. I'm going to be handed over to wicked men. They're going to kill me. I'm going to raise on the third day. Now, John would say it wasn't until he actually arrived at the empty tomb that he came to understand and believe it. But he's heard everything Peter's heard. No doubt he was right there the same time when Peter said, if they all deny you, I never will. And his voice was one that said, hey, right along with you, Peter, we're not going to do this. And John is fighting to stay faithful and loyal and true. Look at chapter 18, verses 15 and 16. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. It is thought that this was John. John's way of uh, writing in his gospel is not to mention himself by name unless he's offering a list 
of the apostles. So it is almost certain that John is this other disciple here. That is, as we said, his characteristic way of describing himself, also the disciple whom Jesus loved. We'll see that in just a moment. So John gets Peter into the high priest's courtyard, but he doesn't seem to be there with Peter as Peter is denying the Lord. Where is John? Many believe that John has gone in even further and is kind of right there at the outside of the hearing itself, listening to everything that is happening that may very well be true. But what is absolutely true, and we know it for certain, while we don't see any of the apostles at the cross, we do see one, and that's John. Look with me at chapter 19, verses 26 and 27. This is just one of the most touching scenes, I believe, in all of the Bible. John 19, 26 and 27. <coughs> Excuse me. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. You see, John is just as brokenhearted as Peter. John is just as brokenhearted as everyone else. But now Jesus has done something to John, even as Jesus was dying. While John might have been inclined at first to go find a private place and just mourn and just kind of just, just sink into a, a bit of a funk and a depression here, he's not going to have the opportunity now because there's the Lord's mother. This is a mother watching her son die this way. I can't even imagine that. Imagine the state she's in, and now she's been passed over. So there is loyal John. There is trustworthy, good, decent man, the, uh, the best friend you could have. There he is, and he's going to take that responsibility. And he's going to immediately bring her into his house to the very end John is fighting to stay faithful and loyal and true to the Lord. But there is another apostle that I want to consider for a moment. His name was Judas. Judas is the one who betrayed Jesus to these people that hated him so much. Judas had a change of mind. You know, some it's interesting to, to hear and to see what people have said about Judas, why he did what he did, what motivations he might have had. Some have suggested perhaps he wanted Jesus to kind of pick up steam a little bit. And, and, and you know, maybe he wanted to have a, a, a really big confrontation between Jesus and the authorities. And Jesus would do something that would just show the whole world that he is who we claim to be, which is actually what's going to happen. But a lot of people seem to try to be finding a way to almost excuse Judas or in some way justify him. But let's remember the words of Jesus himself. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man never to have been born. Jesus wasn't justifying anything here or seeking to excuse it. But Judas has done what he's done. And seeing how things are going, he changes his mind. Verse 3. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See, do it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. It seems to have finally dawned on Judas just exactly what it was he had done. And the enormity of that betrayal broke him. And not seeing any way to live with this, not seeing any way to alleviate the pain that he was apparently feeling. Judas went out and he killed himself. And if we were to read the first chapter 
of Acts chapter 1, we would see that his end was even more disgusting than this indicates in Matthew's gospel. I want to talk about another apostle. I want to talk to you about Thomas. Thomas was absolutely devastated. You know, the interesting thing about Thomas, he, he seems to have a rather gloomy disposition. Whenever we see Thomas rising above the other ones to the point where he gets his own words and we know he's the one who's speaking, it's usually not very happy sorts of thoughts. Thomas is the one. When Lazarus died and Jesus had determined they were going to go back, Thomas is the one who said, well, let's go die with him. Because he couldn't fathom any scenario where going back to Judea would not ultimately lead to Jesus' death. So let's just, let's all go back and we'll just die together. After the resurrection, but before Thomas was willing to accept that it happened, we find the famous words over in John chapter 20 and verse 25. John chapter 20 and verse 25. We'll pick up in verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Thomas is devastated here. There's no doubt that Thomas loved Jesus and he loved him deeply. There is no question about that. I'll say it again. He was the one of all the apostles who said, let's go back to Judea with Jesus and we're just going to go and die with him. That was Thomas who said that. He loved Jesus deeply. His devastation is such that there is nothing ordinary, not even the words of these men that he has worked with, who have also sat at the, at the feet of Jesus. His devastation is such that there is nothing ordinary that is going to be able to alleviate the pain he was experiencing. That's where Thomas was. I'm not going to believe it. I'm going to have to see him. And even more than that, I'm going to have to be able to touch the wounded areas before I'm going to be willing to believe that he is alive. And this comes from a man who had seen incredible miracles from Jesus, even raising the dead. But he was devastated to such a point he wasn't willing to believe, able to believe perhaps, that it happened with Jesus. There's a couple of traveling disciples that we run into over in Luke 24. Now, we actually see them after the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, he appears to them, and it's that appearing that occasions the conversation. But this tells us where they were in their minds, in their hearts, before the resurrection. Let's pick up in verse 13 of chapter 24. <coughs> That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word uh, before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company, uh, our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. 
Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. There seems to be absolutely no thought on their part that he's actually risen here. Maybe they're thinking along with, with the story that would circulate. There must have been some disciples of Jesus who came and stole him away. But it certainly wasn't those disciples. They don't seem to have in any way, shape, or form believed or even seemed inclined to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. Did you notice what we're told they said here in verse 1? We had hoped. The word but's there first. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Well, what had happened to, 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 to dash and to shatter those hopes? The cross happened. The crucifixion happened. And then he died. He did not miraculously come down from that cross. He did not call on legions of angels to come and save him. He died there. His side was pierced with a spear. He was put in a tomb. He died there. And with him died their messianic hopes. Then I have got to believe... They were not unique among the Lord's disciples at that time. Jesus died. And their messianic expectations died right along with him. There's one more individual that I, I want us to consider. Someone who was in the Lord's orbit. And it's Nicodemus. We're, turn your Bibles over to John 19. So Nicodemus is there with Joseph of Arimathea. We can read about him in verses 38 um, through 40 here. John 19, verses 38 through 40. And the passage says this. <clears throat> After these things, the these things is the death of Jesus here. Um, After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now, when John mentions there, this is the same Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night. Well, that takes us back to John 3, right? And we know that Nicodemus came. And remember, the first recorded words of Nicodemus, he said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these things unless God is with him. So Nicodemus was at least intrigued by Jesus. And then there in John 3, he seems to have stayed as long as Jesus intended to talk to him. So it wasn't like as soon as Nicodemus heard something he didn't understand, he didn't say, this is just absolutely ridiculous and I'm walking away. He stayed right there. He was willing to listen and hear what Jesus had to say. We move forward a little bit in John's gospel. We get over to John 7 and we find Nicodemus is the one as the council is just ripping into that man who was born blind but now can see. As they're just doing all of those things, Nicodemus is the one. When those officers did not bring back Jesus as the council had said, he's the one who said, listen, guys, does our law judge a man without first hearing what he's got to say? And that didn't go over so well for Nicodemus or with the council. He was at least intrigued by Jesus. He was even sympathetic, it appears. I don't know what happened with Nicodemus. There's a ton of speculation and theories. I have no idea what happened with him. I pray that he became a Christian and, uh, and, and trusted in I don't know if that's what happened or not. But for him, if he didn't ultimately do that, then I suppose this was just another failed Messiah. In a long list of failed Messiahs and not even the second in Nicodemus' lifetime. And perhaps... Maybe eventually 
we're going to get the real one. And then Sunday came. And everything changed. Turn your Bibles to John 20. Beginning in verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. <coughs> Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, you are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. When we say everything changed that Sunday, why is that? Did you notice that John called this a sign? He's talking about the risen Jesus there. In Romans chapter 1, as Paul is writing about Jesus and a man who had performed 
so many signs throughout his life, as John says there, and would say in the next chapter, that if everything Jesus had ever done and said had been written, all the books in the world couldn't contain it. This was the sign that the Father himself used to declare Jesus to be his Son in power. It was after this sign, after the resurrection of Jesus, that he would say on the mountain to his disciples before he ascended, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And that happened because he was raised from the dead. And if we were to move from there and we get into Acts and we see what the disciples were doing there at first, did you notice in John 20 we were told they were behind closed doors and not just closed doors, locked ones because they were afraid of the Jews. They're frightened, they're sad, they're cowering away and suddenly, almost like that, those frightened, cowering disciples who were afraid to even be seen out in public are standing before the council declaring the resurrection of Jesus? How do you explain that? Besides, he raised. He really did. I want you to look with me, if you will, over at Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, we'll look at that first, then we're going to go to chapter 5. Acts 4 uh, <clears throat> and verse 13. Now Peter and John, they're before the council. The council's telling them, you guys, you stop this. We don't want to hear any more about it. And verse 13 says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Those who have been with Jesus, the way it's being described here, they look like Jesus. They act like Jesus. They're bold like Jesus. And that's an identifying mark of them. But where did it come from? It came from his resurrection. Look at chapter 5, uh, chapter five verses 40 down to 42. Gamaliel has stepped up and convinced them not to kill the apostles at this time. They take that advice. Verse 40 says, And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. These are the same ones who were locked behind closed doors, who were there because they were afraid. And now the highest Jewish court has said to them, you don't say any more about him. We don't want to hear another word about this man. And we're going to beat you to drive the point home. And they left there rejoicing. And they went right into houses. They went right into the temple. And they kept preaching. What happened? Sunday came is what happened. Sunday came. The tomb was empty and Jesus had arisen. Throughout God's activities within the world, he has demonstrated over and over and over again his grace, his love, his mercy, his forgiveness, but never, never in the way he demonstrated it in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, some of the most well-known verses in the New Testament drive that point home. Because that tomb was empty and our Lord raised from the dead, unimaginable access to God was made available that simply did not and could not exist up to that point. I want you to look at this passage with me. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16 says this, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is un 
able to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. People have always, God's people have always been able to find mercy and grace from Him and through Him, but its greatest expression came at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. What a glorious thought that is. And finally, unparalleled joy and confidence became available. The last passage that I want to read with you this morning is from Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. And then we'll read 31 to 39, and the lesson will be yours. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says this. There is, therefore, now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things, present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise God, Sunday came. And everything came with it. And the world was changed forever. As Brother Gary said, every Lord's Day, we celebrate, we remember the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I pray that the sermon this morning helps us all to remember a little bit more exactly what happened there and why it is such an occasion for such rejoicing. Indeed, our very souls depend upon it praise God and praise the Lord that it happened if you're subject to the call of the gospel you're going to have an opportunity right now to become a Christian and I pray that you will do you believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Christ if so you've taken the necessary first step but don't stop there repent of your sins confess your faith in Jesus as Lord and be immersed in water to have your sins washed clean from your soul you will go under in the likeness of our Lord's burial, and you will come back up in the likeness of his resurrection and on the road that leads to heaven. If you're ready for that, please come forward now as together we stand and sing.